you have your Bibles and can turn with me to John chapter number 7. John chapter number 7. We'll continue in our Journey with Jesus series that we were in this morning. And um, it's already been a full service and still more to come. And uh, we'll, we'll get to the close of the service and give you more information about that. But John chapter number 7, we'll be looking at verses 10 through 53, obviously not taking the time to read all of them, but I do want to set the tone for uh, what we'll be speaking on and uh, preaching from this evening. And so John chapter number 7, verse number 10, um, for the sake of the length of the passage, I won't have you stand, but I know sometimes some of you can zone out when we don't stand, and so uh, we'll, we'll follow along. But chapter 7 and verse number 10, the Bible says this, but when his brethren were gone up, then went he also up unto the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. And so just if you were not in here this morning, first, ten, first nine verses of this passage, one of the things that we saw was that Jesus, when he looked at his brothers, said, I'm not going up. And they were kind of trying to draw him out of, uh, of hiding and really uh, and, uh, of, of hiding and veiling who he was and he said the time is not yet full come and uh, they almost used it as a ploy to say well if you do all of these miraculous works why don't you just do them publicly why, why don't you just do them in front of everybody and so his brothers leave and then the bible tells us that he also went up and then it says not openly but as it were in secret then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, where is he? Which as I was studying this past week, one commentator brought out an interesting point that it was uh, interesting that the Jews knew to ask the question where he was. It almost gives us the sense that it makes us think that his brothers could have been informing the leaders of that sect that Jesus was going to come and that they should be prepared. The fact that these Jewish leaders were looking for Jesus tells us that they knew that he had to be there and how they got that information may just be a guess, but uh, it's interesting to think that even his own brothers were a part of possibly showing uh, that he was there. In verse number 12, there was much murmuring among the people concerning him. For some said, he is a good man. Others said, nay, but he deceiveth the people. Howbeit no man spake openly of him for fear of the Jews. Now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory. But he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. That's a very powerful principle. He says, if you seek your own glory, then you are not a righteous person. But if you're constantly seeking the glory of someone else, then that is a proof that there is righteousness in you. And let me just stop right here and say this. This isn't a part of the message, but it's something that I think that we should consider, especially in today's society is if you are surrounded by Christians who are only looking to glorify and promote themselves, that is a telltale sign of unrighteousness. That is a telltale sign that they are seeking glory of themselves because the truly righteous and the true man of God or woman of God is not seeking glory for themselves, but is truly seeking glory for another, which is their heavenly Father. Verse number 19 says... Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you keepeth the law? Why go ye about to kill me? The people answered and said, Thou hast a devil. Who goeth about to kill thee? So they respond kind of like, well, which one of us is it? Like, who is it? Was it me? Was it, who's actually trying to kill you? They're trying to get out of the situation. Jesus answered and said unto them, I have done one work, and ye all marvel. Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers. And ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. If a man on the Sabbath day receives circumcision that the law of Moses should not be broken, are ye angry at me because I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day? Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Would you skip down and look at verse number 28? Then cried Jesus in the temple as he taught, saying, you both know me, and ye know whence I am. And I am not come of myself, but he that sent me is true, whom ye know not. But I know him, for I am from him. 
and he hath sent me. Then they sought to take him, but no man laid hands on him, because his hour was not yet come, and many of the people believed on him, and said, When Christ cometh, will he do more miracles than these which this man hath done? The Pharisees heard that the people murmured such things concerning him, and the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. Then said Jesus unto them, Yet a little while am I with you, and then I go unto him that sent me. Ye shall seek me, and shall not find me. And where I am, thither ye cannot come. Skip down and look at verse number 37. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me, and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Would you look at verse number 40? Many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said, of a truth, this is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, shall Christ come out of Galilee? Hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem where David was? So there was a division among the people because of him. And some of them would have taken him, but no man laid hands on him. Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto them, Why have ye not brought him? The officers answered, Never man spake like this man. Then answered them them the Pharisees, Are ye also deceived? Have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed on him? But this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. Nicodemus saith unto them that he saith unto them, he that came to Jesus by night being one of them, doth our law judge any man before it hear him and know what he doeth? They answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look. For out of Galilee ariseth no prophet, and every man went unto his own house. I want you to go back up, and I want you to look at verse number 11 of chapter number 7. And if you would read verse number 11 out loud together with me, the Bible says, ready, begin. Then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, where is he? It's an interesting story that we have in this passage What I believe that this chapter and these verses give us are different responses to the Savior. And so I would like to simply bring a message this evening, and I'll try to be brief. I know the time has been long this evening, and so I want to be cognizant of that, but I also want to uh, do well to preach the Word of God and the full truth. I want to bring a message just simply entitled, Your Response is Showing. Your response is showing. And we'll look at five responses from this passage and we'll ask the Lord to apply them to our hearts. Let's pray and we'll ask the Lord to help us. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I'm so grateful for your word. Lord, may we be a church that just as Brother Hickson shared of the people of Thailand, may we be hungry for your word. May we find ourselves filled with it. May we find ourselves applying it and meditating upon it. And may we find ourselves doing it. And Lord, as we look through these responses of the people in this passage, we understand that these are not just the responses of people in your word. Lord, these are the responses of Christians in today's society, of the unsaved in this society. And Lord, may we find ourselves responding to you as you would have us to. Lord, may we be sensitive to your work and to your spirit. Lord, may you speak to our hearts this evening. Lord, fill me with your spirit. Empty me of myself and hide me behind your cross that this congregation may see you and not see me. In your name we pray, amen. This past week I read, the, uh, read an interesting story, an interesting uh, post that someone had sent me. And it was the story of a man who was waiting in a drive through line and the lady behind him began to grow impatient at how long his order was. And she began to honk and lean her head out the window and yell at him and make some, make some pretty obscene gestures. And so he, he, he just kept looking in his rear view mirror and kept, kept kind of wondering when this lady was going to calm down. And so he decided to take matters into his own hands 
hands, and so he asked the, uh, asked the lady at the window if, uh, if he could pay for her order behind him. And uh, so he paid for his order and paid for the order of the lady behind him. And, uh, and he, when she found out about it, he looked in his rearview mirror and, he, and she just kind of dropped her head and waved and gave him a thumbs up. And you could tell that she was very embarrassed. And so the man said, I hope that she will learn her lesson now about how she responds to people in this day and age. And if that didn't teach her to learn her lesson, me showing the manager both of the receipts and taking her food and making her start all over again will definitely help her learn her lesson. And you know, we're really good at recognizing everyone else's bad response to situations. But sometimes we are not always so good at recognizing our own poor response to situations. It's very easy to diagnose the wrong response of the world. But it can sometimes be somewhat difficult to diagnose and to look at our own response in our life. And in chapter number 7, you see a multitude of responses to Jesus. Just like anyone else who comes onto the scene and gathers a following and gathers a group of people and begins to work and begins to have influence, people felt differently about Jesus. They responded differently. And as we look through these five responses that we'll see from chapter number seven, the goal is not that we would diagnose the wrong response of the people in scripture, but that we would potentially diagnose the wrong response of our own heart. You see, I firmly believe this, that we as Christians today in this society, we are not called to be the exception, but we are called to be the example. We are not called to be the the people who say, well, Jesus will let me slide because I'm one of his children. We are called to be the example. And it could very well be that the reason why our world and our country and our, our churches and our communities are facing the evil response of the world is simply because it is a learned response as worldly, unsaved people has watched how the church has responded to the call of Jesus Christ. We've become very content to just stay in our comfort zone and to sit in our seats and to maybe not feel the Holy Spirit's prompting. We've been very content for lackluster relationships with spouses. We've been very content to allow the world to have a stronghold on our children. We've become very content to keep our mouths closed when it comes to sharing about God and His Word and His work in our life. And it could very well be that we have prepared the world's response by them simply watching at how we have responded to Christ over these last years. And the diagnosis this evening is not one from John chapter number 7, but it is a diagnosis of you and I and our response to Jesus today in 2024. What I'd like to do is I will give you the response, but I want you also with each of these points to see what they are responding to. The first one that you'll see is this, and you see this in our passage that we preached through this morning of verses 1 through 9. You see the response of disbelief. The response of disbelief. What are they in disbelief of? It is in regards to the timing and the work of Jesus Christ, if you'll refer back to the message this morning. They didn't believe that he was who he said he was. They didn't believe that he was actually going to do anything. They didn't believe in his timing and and the fact that he was going to eventually reveal himself. And so they were almost trying to push Jesus into the spotlight and, and they were trying to rush the timing of the Heavenly Father. And their response was that they responded in disbelief. I know my crowd, I know the church that I'm speaking to, I don't know that we have anyone in the room that would be sitting here and saying, you know, the whole Jesus thing, I don't, I don't know that I believe that. You may have slipped in among us and slipped into our services this evening and you don't believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you don't believe that Jesus can save you, may I encourage you this evening that Jesus is the Son of God, he died for your sins and if you accept him, you can have eternity in heaven in a relationship with God. Not because Joel North said it, but because the Word of God said it. But in regards to the Christian, in regards to the people who knew better, we may not respond in disbelief in regards to our salvation, 
But we can very often and very easily respond in disbelief when Jesus calls us to do something. When Jesus leads us into something. We can doubt the faithfulness of God. We can doubt the goodness of God. We can doubt the work and the will of God. And this evening what I want us to notice is that his own family responded in disbelief. But it is a sad situation that Christians who have had over 2,000 years of the work of Jesus Christ to look at, the Word of God to look at, the people of God, the answered prayers, the work of God, all of these attributes that we have seen and we step back and for 2,024 years Jesus Christ has been working after the death of Christ and we step back and think to ourselves, well, I'm not positive that that one's going to work in 2024. I just don't know that I can act in faith. I just don't know if that's actually true. And so we respond in disbelief. The second response that we see in this passage is the response of discord. The response of discord. What was this in regards to? It was in regards to the presence of Christ. Once you look at verse number 10. When his brethren were gone up, then went he also up unto the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. Then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, where is he? And there was much murmuring among the people concerning him. For some said he is a good man, others said nay, but he deceiveth the people, howbeit no man spake openly of him for fear of the Jews. When Jesus arrives on the scene, there begins to be a moment of discord. A moment of people saying, well, I think he's a good man. And some people say, well, no, I I don't think that he is. And maybe certain people saying, well, if this is how all this is going to go, I'm just not going to talk about it. I'm just not going to reference it because I I don't want to get myself in trouble here. There there was friction. There, there There was a moment where all of a sudden Jesus enters into the presence and Jesus walks in to this feast and there begins to be a moment of discord. And let me just encourage you with this. That as a child of God, with the presence of His Spirit in your life, when the presence of God shows up, it does not always bring unity in this world. It quite often, more properly, brings discord. When you step on the scene as a child of God and you bring the presence of God with you, Don't expect for everyone to pull out the confetti and the poppers and the party hats because you showed up with Jesus. But at the same time, what we must understand is this. While the presence of Christ can so often sow discord in the people who don't want him there, it also can bring peace to the ones who do. I want to say that again because it's so easy for it to fly over our heads. While the presence of Christ can so often bring discord to those who don't want him there, it can bring peace to those who do want him there. You may be sitting here this evening and you say, well, I find myself in a work situation where every time I talk about Jesus Christ, it just creates friction and it turns into a debate. And so I just kind of want to stay hushed up about it. I can promise you this, that every time you speak up for Christ, yes, there will be discord, but there's a silent little Christian somewhere around the corner that's thinking to themselves, hmm, man, I'm glad they said that. I'm glad I'm not alone in this. Lee Strobel tells the story of, going and inv- of a man going and inviting someone to his Easter service, inviting him to be a part of Easter services at his church. And he said the man responded with an absolute horrible attitude, said, who do you think you are that I would ever enter into your services? He, Lee Strobel says, I walked away discouraged, defeated, just unbelie- just so distraught over the fact that someone would respond to my invitation about, that, about Jesus and about Easter in that way. The story goes on to say that there was a man in the cubicle next to him that was down on his hands and knees and that was scrubbing the floor of that cubicle 
And he heard the invitation to Easter Sunday and showed up the following Sunday and accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior. And years later, he stood before Lee Strobel and he said, do you remember the man that you invited in that cubicle and he gave you a horrible response and said he would never enter the doors of the church? Do you remember that? He said, yeah. He said, it made me want to almost give up sharing the gospel forever. He said, well, I was in the next cubicle on my hands and knees and I accepted Jesus Christ as a result of that man turning away from you. And just like we heard this evening, we never know the work that God is doing. And the presence of Christ, when Jesus shows up on the scene, it may bring discord to some, but it brings peace to so many others. And it's not our responsibility to, to hide that presence because of the discord it brings. It's our responsibility to shine the light of Jesus Christ brighter and brighter because while there are some who it will bring discord to, there are many others that it will bring peace to. And so the response of discord, but thirdly, the response of disobedience. The response of disobedience. I love verse number 19. Really, Jesus really mixes his words here, so we're going to have to pay attention very closely. He says, did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you keepeth the law? Do you notice how blatant he was with these people who were trying to make a big deal out of something? You broke the law. And he said, Moses gave you the law and you don't keep it. He said, you're upset with me because I healed someone and made them whole. When the truth is, is that you would break your own law. And he gives an illustration of this in the following verses. He said, you would break your own law to keep a portion of the law that you elevated. So why are you upset with me because I healed a man and made him completely whole on your Sabbath day? The response is disobedience in church family. This is in regards to the doctrine of Christ. He says in verse number 16, he says, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. This evening, church family, I don't know that there has ever been a more relevant time for obedience to Jesus Christ and his word than today's society. I firmly believe that if there will be a reviving of our country and a reviving of our nation, that it will not be on the backs of the freedom-seeking Christians, but on the, holy, on the backs of the holiness-seeking Christians. Not in that we take pride in our holiness, not in that we become consumed with ourselves in our holiness, not in that we become holy so that we look good, but we are holy because he is holy and that obedience will be the pathway to revival. The truth is the reason why we as a country and maybe even the reason why we as a church or, or you as a family do not have revival is not because it is not possible, but it could very well be because we do not want the obedience that goes along with revival. We're great as long as God doesn't challenge us or push us or change us. But if he truly begins to work in our hearts and in our lives, if he begins to fashion us and form us into the mold and the making and the image of his son, if he truly begins to do that, there would be some Christians that would throw their hand up and, hands up and say, foul, I'm not going any further than this. If God truly began to insert himself into your home, would you allow him to change it? If God truly convicted you of the TV show that you're watching, would you truly shut it off? If God truly convicted you of your soul winning, of your service, of your, of your time for him, would you even be willing to change it? And so it could be that while we pray for revival, the truth is that we need to pray for ourselves to be accepting of the work that revival brings with it. We need to become obedient followers of Jesus Christ, not people who are just consumed with our rules and our laws and, and the things that we want to do. We must truly become consumed with responding to Jesus Christ in obedience. And then fourthly is this. You see the response of division. The response of division. In verse number 31, the Bible says, and many of the people believed on him and said, When Christ cometh, will he do more miracles than these which this man hath done? But I want you to skip down and look at verse number 41. Others said, 
This is the Christ, but some said, Shall Christ come out of Galilee? Hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David and of the t- out of the town of Bethlehem where David was? So there was a division among the people because of him. I will tell you this, that while Jesus in this passage divides, it is time for us as a church family and as Christians to allow the presence and work of Jesus Christ to be a unifying factor and not a dividing factor. Our competition, church, is not with a church that does it differently. It is with the work of this world. We do not battle against flesh and blood. And here this evening, my heart is simply this that I firmly believe that what will unite this church as we move forward is not which sports teams we cheer for, is not the places that we work, is not our mutual interest, but it is a mutual passion for the unifying work and blood of Jesus Christ that unites us all. We have got to get out of this phase, well, well, they're that type of Christian and I'm this type of Christian and I go to this church and and I do this and, and I do that. And what we must come back to is this, under the blood of Jesus Christ, we are all on level playing fields. Under the blood of Jesus Christ, we are on the same team. And I don't know about you, and this may be a little bit unrealistic, but I don't wanna be on a horse in the battle of Armageddon beside a guy that I threw a stone at on this earth. Baylor Michelle Norris's favorite part of prophecy is that she's going to get to ride a horse one day. So we hope it's true, all right? But we often make our battle who we see this way and not the world that is constantly attacking us. Husband, your wife is not your battlefield. In fact, she's your partner in war, so you better get her close. Wife, your husband is not your enemy. The devil is the enemy of that home. Both of you get your swords ready and attack them together. Church, our enemy is not some other Christian or some other type of church. Our enemy is the devil. And the day that we identify the devil and we strap our swords on and we get our shields ready and we fight the wily darts of the devil and we make him the enemy and not each other is the day that this church will begin to march forward for the cause of Jesus Christ because we've identified who is wrong and who is right and we're on the same team fighting for the same God, going to the same place and in the same army. So we might as well go ahead and say, the devil's the enemy, Jesus is the Savior, he's the captain, and I'm going to fight for him. Let's stop dividing over the things that don't matter and start fighting over the things that do matter. While the church has pulled its arrows back at each other, abortion has ran rampant. While the church has pulled its arrows back at other Christians, homosexuality has run rampant. While we've let our marriages fail, the homosexual marriages are now legal. So let me ask you a question. Has it worked for us? Our enemy is not each other. Our enemy is not the fellow soldier of the cross of Jesus Christ. Our enemy is the same serpent that beguiled Eve in the garden and he's still walking about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour and he's eaten too many Christians up because they identified the wrong enemy and they lost the fight with the devil. And when Jesus shows up on the scene, there is this constant division of people saying, well, I think he's okay and I don't think he's okay. And what we must become convinced of this evening is that our response is not going to be division. Our response is going to be that we are all blood-stained warriors of the cross of Jesus Christ. And if we lift anything up, it's going to be him and his blood and his work and his gospel and not me and not myself and not my issues and not my problems and not my agenda because Jesus is the captain of the army and until we stop fighting each other we better never get ready to see the battle won in this world when Jesus enters into the scene there is division 
But the truth is, is that he should be bringing unity to you and I because each and every one of us are following him as our leader. And lastly is simply this. There's the response of division regarding the salvation of Christ, but there is also the response of decision regarding the person of Christ. I want you to look at verse number 45. The Bible says, Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto them, Why have ye not brought him? The officers answered, Never spake like this man. I love this. Can't you just see the Pharisees? I bet their heads were spinning on this day. I think you see that in chapter number seven. Some Jews show up and say, where is he? And Pharisees are shuffling over here. Like, oh my goodness, I think he's over here. Well, no, he's actually teaching in the temple. Well, let's get to the temple. What are we doing over here? And then he says something. I love it. That I think it's so humorous. If you read through this passage, I don't know if you have a red letter edition of your Bible, but it's, it, the red letters, it's almost like Jesus stirs the pot. Okay, the black letters are the Pharisees pulling their hair out, just to summarize chapter number seven. The red letters is Jesus says, if you're thirsty, come get something to drink from me. Drink and have living water. And the oh, are you serious? Did he just say he had living water? What does that even mean? I don't know, but we're mad about it. Did, did he just say he was going to go away? Where's he going? He didn't clear that with us. And over and over again, they get upset at what Jesus says, but in verse number 45, they say, why have you not brought him? The officers said, never spake a man like this. Then answered them the Pharisees, are ye also deceived? Have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed on him? Have any of the big wigs, have any of the big dogs believed on him? You see any of us following him? You see anything going wrong here? No, we need you to bring this guy in. But this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. There's a guy who shows up from earlier in the book of John. Nicodemus saith unto them, This is he that came to Jesus by night, being one of them. Doth our law judge any man before it hear him and know what he doeth? They answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. And every man went unto his own house. These verses are interesting because what it tells us is that whatever conversation Jesus had with Nicodemus in John 3 has not fully sunk in. In fact, we don't know Nicodemus' final response to Jesus. But what we see here is four chapters after Jesus has the notorious conversation with him of John chapter number three, that he's still with the same group of guys. He's still a part of the same sect. And he says, does our law not give him the chance to hear him out and before we make a judgment of him? And the Pharisees look back at him and say, you need to reevaluate. And tonight, while the world continues to degrade our Savior, Jesus Christ, it is time that Christians make a decision of which side of the fence they are going to fall on. While the world drags his name through mud, while the world continues to change its drum, and how they march to it, while the world continues to welcome in evil, Christians are at a place of decision. Much like the decision that Joshua brings to the children of Israel in chapter number 24, when he looks at them and says, choose you this day whom you will serve. And tonight, I don't think I'm talking to a church and a church family that the decision is between serving God or serving evil. I think the decision for us lies in serving God or serving self. Serving God or being surrendered to the things of this world. 
selling out for God and chasing after him wholeheartedly or selling out to this world and chasing after it wholeheartedly. Because this response of decision is not in regards to the things that he said, but this is a specific attack on who he is. These Pharisees were attacking the integrity and the character and the person of Jesus Christ. And Nicodemus speaks up and says, don't we need to give the guy a chance according to our law? And it's interesting to me that they were willing to bend the rules of their law to accommodate their action toward Jesus Christ. And Christian, the world will bend the rules of their tolerance to hate Jesus Christ. But Christians also have a way of bending the word of God to accommodate their worldliness. Well, it's not that bad. I mean, it, it can't send me to hell. Once saved, always saved. It's amazing the principles we pick up on. And this evening, we are at a crossroads as a country, as a church, as homes, as families, as individuals. And it's time that we make a decision to say, I'm all in. You say, well, I don't know where that decision goes. I don't know what's going to happen. Could lead you to Thailand. Some of you are like, well, there you go. Proof right there. I'm not going to do it. Or, or, by being surrendered to Jesus Christ and it leads you to Thailand, there could be fruit in heaven as a result of your decision. Or, God could do something with your home and your family. Or, we could reach a community for Christ. Or, we could see God bring revival because we just said, I'm sick of it. I'm sick of the world. I'm sick of the disobedience. I'm sick of the discord. I'm sick of the disbelief. I'm all in. The lady by the name of Susanna Wesley Right now, we're watching the Methodist church fall apart at the seams by the worldliness that they're welcoming. But its founders, they call Susanna Wesley the mother of Methodism. John Wesley, Charles Wesley, their mother was Susanna Wesley. Both men of God. Susanna Wesley never wrote a book, never wrote a song, Never led a church, but she led her family. She wrote a note to her husband, and I don't have the exact quote in front of me, but she wrote the note to her husband and through her journal, and she said, it came to my mind last night that while I may never hold a pastoral position in the church, I hold a pastoral position with my family to continually point them to Jesus Christ and allow him to do the work in their life. She taught her children that for every hour that they spent in recreation, they needed to spend an equal amount of time in devotion to their Savior. So it's no wonder that she raised two young men and dedicated them to the Lord, who still to this day, universities are named after them, songs are sung from their hand, and people refer to the Wesley name over and over again, not because of John and Charles Wesley, but because of a mother named Susanna Wesley who just did what God told her to do, and she made a decision to invest in her children. It's not always the big and bold decisions that bring forth fruit for Jesus Christ. Sometimes it's the small, simple decisions where we just say, Lord, I'm trusting you with what I hold in my hand. With every head down.